the special today. In Galatians chapter 1, which I'll be in in a minute, and from 1 Corinthians as well, Paul warned, gave, gives the same warning. He warns people against uh, the believers that those churches of embracing what he calls another gospel, or another Jesus. And I'm glad today that Jesus did pay it all, like it says in that hymn we just sang here to start the services today. Because without Christ, it's not as if we have a little hope, but we have no hope without Christ. My hope is not in myself. It's not in our government. It's not in you. I hope you're not offended. But my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Yeah. Now, this song, you know, songs, we give them some leeway, right? They're not Scripture. But it's a supposition, you know. Boy, what if? What if we didn't have Jesus? It had it not been. And I shudder at the thought, you know, had it not been for Jesus, right? So let me sing this. Had it not been. Just suppose God searched through heaven Couldn't find one willing to be The supreme sacrifice that was needed To buy eternal life for you and me Had it not been for a place called my Calvary Had it not give you two texts today. I already said that, right? Galatians chapter 1. Let me see here. I, I, didn't, I didn't say the chapter on the Corinthians because I didn't remember it, you know. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So Galatians chapter 1 and 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, the warning is the same to both of these, to the churches of Galatia, to the church at Corinth, to the church at Wyoming, Illinois today. Yeah. And it definitely is a warning passage. What we call a warning passage. Galatians chapter 1. Now I want to read, I'm going to read more verses in Galatians 1 than I will in 1 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians. But I want to read that first. The first 12 verses of Galatians chapter 1. Paul an apostle not of men, neither by men, uh, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised Him from the dead. All the brethren which are with me under the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from the present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another Gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the Gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other Gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other Gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the Gospel which was preached of me is not after man. 
For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then I want to read, as I said, from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, just the four, uh, first four verses. Paul writing to the Corinthians. He says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So these two passages are very similar because they have a, a similar intent. And this is a warning. Now you've heard that before, maybe when a preacher or myself or others, uh, particularly we go to the, uh, we're looking at the prophets, you'll find a lot of what would be called warning passages. Not every passage in the Bible is a warning passage, but these certainly are. There are many warning passages in Scripture, and none are without importance. Uh, when we perceive from Scripture, we've read something, you're like, oh, wow. There's a warning. Now, the prophets would say it this way. Sometimes it gives it away. You're about to read what we would call a warning passage when a prophet says, woe unto you, something like that. Uh, and so he doesn't use those words here. But when we perceive that the, from the Scriptures that a warning is issued, we ought to pay special attention. I mean, we don't, we don't skim over that. We don't go just go past that. We don't let that go in one ear and out the other. And so, now no warning from God. I mean, these are warnings from God. You know, we warn our kids, hey, stop that. You're going to get in trouble. And they, they sometimes ignore those things. But this is a warning from God. This is a warning to His church. This is a warning that's not outdated. It's a warning that we need to heed at First Baptist Church. We need to open our eyes up, open our ears, sit up on the edge of the I mean, We need to listen today and read today. So no warning from God is insignificant. But we could argue that perhaps there are some warnings that are of greater importance than others. And I know that that you know, could involve our opinions. But I mean, think about life in general. We're warning our kids, right? Charity's a little toddlers. Don't do that. You can get hurt doing that. But then again, there are some things they can do that they can really get hurt doing that. I mean, they can get hurt, you know, getting their hand in the refrigerator door, but you can get your hurt hand hurt a lot worse getting it in the front door. There are things they can do. If they're on the edge of the chair, they might fall off. But also, kids, you know, Joshua doesn't have any appreciation for heights. I mean, he would walk off the top of a building, and it'd be a lot worse than walking off the chair. So what I'm saying is not all warnings. Even we as parents understand when we give a warning say, hey, stop, hey, listen, that not all warnings are the same. The summer of great urgency. Sometimes we lift our voices. Sometimes we scream, right? Because it's a very important warning. Just like the time when I was pastor in Missouri, Michael was a year and a half old or less. He's just a toddler. He had a fascination. He went through that period. It's like outlets. There's this thing on the wall and it has holes in it. Suddenly he noticed them. And he was constantly putting things in there. Now sometimes it was a pencil, a wooden pencil. And you know, he, he was all right with that. And, I mean, I'm going to stop him. He's just, but every time I turn around, he's heading toward an outlet. And the church there was much like this. We had the uh, wainscot or paneling halfway up. We had the outlets between the windows. I and mean, it was like that. And there are a height where toddlers are looking at that and all that. But one, one day we're standing around the fellowship. And I don't even know where he got it. But it looked like it was just a little sliver of metal. I mean, like off of a roll of uh, flat metal, half inch. I mean, it would have perfectly went in. It was that long. And I see him heading toward an outlet. And so I'm talking to all these men in the church. And of course, you know what I do. I scream. I'm like, no! You know, like that. We had a gentleman in our church, an older gentleman in the 70s, and he had seen this going on. He said, oh, just let him do that. He'll only do it once. No, I'm not going to let him do that. Okay? So here we have a warning passage. And as I said, some warnings are like you, you know, going to the outlet with the metal, right? I could give, I, you know what, I don't want to preach all day, but I'll tell you another one real quick because it just happened. I plug this van in, right? My work van. I do that because I have a little refrigerator in there with some water and soda, okay, and stuff like that. I, my last van, when I would plug it in, it would sometimes shock you. So be careful touching that, right? And I thought it was the cord. I thought it must be the cord. You know, the cord must be bad. 
So when they work out me this new van, I put the same refrigerator in. It sits on the middle floor, and I plug it in with a different cord. And I noticed if I don't have shoes on, that van shocks me. It never shocks me with shoes on, but if I don't have one, it'll zap you when you touch it if I have it plugged in. And so I come home from work one night last week, and here comes Cody and Ellie running. And of course, they don't have shoes on. You know, you're home, Uncle Joe's home. Man, I'm like, hey, get back from this van. You know, I had already plugged it in when they come running over. I plugged it in. I said, now get back. You're both barefoot. Don't touch this van. I saw it, the look in Ellie's eyes. Cody had experienced it before. He goes, yeah, don't touch it. I turn around and I hear, ah! guess what she did as soon as I turn? And she's just like this. And I'm like, I just told you, if you touch that van, you're going to get shot. So here's a, that was a warning from Uncle Joe. Here's a warning passage from God. And some are really serious, and we need to listen to them, and we need to be careful, and there, there are serious consequences, right? So how significant is this warning? Be care, beware of an, uh, another gospel. Beware of another Jesus. And he tells us about the nature of that gospel in Galatians because he says the gospel that he's preached is not after man. It's not a focus on man. It's not of a humanistic sort, right? He tells us where he didn't get it from any man. Paul had all kinds of religious instruction and teaching, but he says the gospel that I've been preaching, I didn't get it from man. So, so how close... How closely should we look at this warning? Using the lens of Scripture as our view and focus, how closely should we examine this? I believe that the warning found here, both to the Corinthians and the Galatians, to be as serious of any warning from God could be. Now, but it's also not a warning to directly to the lost, but it's certainly going to affect them. It's a warning to you and I. And it's a warning concerning the gospel that's been preached. And it could be a warning to you here today, if you are unsaved, but you have believed another gospel of sorts. Paul warns against another Jesus or another gospel. He seems very alarmed at some things he's heard concerning those in Galatia. And he's very jealous over those at Corinth. He had invested in them. He, uh, he felt, uh, and, and he uses language that shows that he feels a fatherly influence in them because he says, I've espoused you to one, to, to their bridegroom which is Christ, the groomsman. And uh, he says, I want to I help uh, teach and preserve you and present you at that day to Him, faultless and blameless. And we're going to have to maintain the Gospel, the purity of the Gospel, if we're going to do that. So he, he warns against another Gospel. What is another Gospel? I mean, that could be really broad-ended and open, right? So, in truth, when I say, you know, I want to reprove another Gospel, you might think, boy, he's going to be preaching a while today. Because let me say... There could be limitless alternatives to the gospel. I mean, that's always the truth. If you have, you know, the truth, or if you have a story, or whatever details, and you want to alter them, you could continue to do so. So you could have not just a second story or a third story. You could have a million different opinions and stories. So there are limitless alternatives to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the gospel given to us by His apostles, who received it directly from Him. By the way. Paul talks about where he got his gospel. We need to emphasize that. We need to know where we got our teaching. And be honest about that. And be truthful about that. With ourselves. Where we got... Why, why do you believe what you believe? Most... You know, there are too many people going to church, they know what they believe. Don't ever say it that way. I've heard preachers say, well, people don't know what they believe. Yeah, they do. They don't know why. They don't know where that comes from. And uh, they, can't, they can't necessarily look to Scripture for a lot of those things. Most people know what they believe. They're very strong in it. They're very stubborn in it. They were always taught some of those things. Or that's the way it fits in their box. So they perceive those things. But another gospel. Limitless alternatives. We need to know, as I said, where we got it from. So Paul says he got the gospel from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe it. The New Testament was given to us by pr predominantly, most of it, by the, hand of the hands of the apostles. Which is important. It's good, I mean, because we know that the apostles received their teaching by faith. We believe that their doctrine from the Lord Himself, and so it's the only way that we can get the Lord's teaching. Because He's not here; He's not walking among us. You say, "Oh, but we have the Gospels and the words in red." The apostles gave it to us that, either directly or under their tutelage and influence, under their ministry. They they were they were foundational members of the Lord's church, and once the Lord's gone, the church had the apostles and their teaching, and they wrote these things down for us at a later time. We know that Jesus promised that the Spirit of God would bring to remembrance for these twelve men 
remembrance the things that he had said to them and taught them over that three year period and we believe that he did we have the new testament today and i'm thankful so we don't have to come up with the gospel we don't have to imagine it we don't have to redesign it revamp it but we still have a new testament to preach and teach from and that is where we find the truth of the gospel so it's important that we maintain the teachings of the apostles so today, as I said, there's limitless alternatives to the Gospel. So to attempt to scripturally refute each one individually would be an endless task. It would. I could ramble today about the cults, right? Or religious offshoots. Movements that arose and some have died off. The errors of particular doctrines that are affecting so many. The errors of baptismal regeneration. Uh, or, or the, of the supposed sacraments. But I want to approach more narrowly and, and as much as I can be positive, though I am going to expose just a few things. And I believe, I believe biblically. It is not a coincidence, by the way, so I'm primarily talking about another gospel, another gospel. But it is not a coincidence that Paul warns them and he says, of another Jesus. That's actually kind of an odd way of saying what he's saying. Now, we know what the context of this is. It is another gospel. A false gospel. Or adding things to that or detracting from that, taking away from that. But then he throws this in here, another Jesus. Now, Jesus is a person. What does he mean when he says another Jesus? Is he thinking, I mean, is he saying to the church that somebody's going to put a mask on? Or somebody's going to say, no, no, that wasn't Jesus. This is Jesus. By the way, that's his first name. Right? Jesus. He's not even saying another Christ, another Savior, another... But it is. And I think it's purposeful when he says this, another Jesus. I think he's once again talking about the doctrine that he and the other apostles had taught and preached concerning Christ. Because that is at the heart of the Gospel. So I want to point that out. When he's warning against another Gospel, that he adds this in there and says, another Jesus. What people say and teach about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Because... All deviations from Christ's Gospel have a common thread, which really is the elevation of man rather than Christ Himself. And I really believe that. Now you may not, when I say that, you may think of some false things concerning the Gospel and not see that at the onset, but it does. Literally, rather than dealing with each one, we could say that the false Gospels that men come up with Put a focus on man's efforts, man's accomplishments, man's obedience, man's sincerity, man's perceived merits, rather than just the person of Christ, faith in Him, that is all. You cannot add anything to that. You cannot take anything away from that. Jesus didn't need your help. Christ went to the cross because we could do nothing. We had nothing. We are bankrupt. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were without hope, when we were helpless and without strength in due time, Christ died not for the godly, but for the ungodly. And so, uh, that is really the common thread of false gospels. And by the way, it's no coincidence that Paul then says, you know, do I persuade men or God? He says, I'm not going to preach in a way, you know, that is displeasing to God because... Uh, I'm not going to try and tickle men's ears. He says, I did not receive this gospel from men. It is not of a humanistic sort. Most people today, most often, when they say they're going to preach the gospel, it's a very humanistic message. So this may be hard to really understand or admit for us, but understand that the gospel is not about you. Really. It is for you. Uh, we think of heaven. And we want to attempt, uh, we want to tempt people or, you know, attract them with heaven. I mean, who wouldn't be? And so, you know, sometimes when we're presenting the gospel, people present it at a youth camp, you know, and at the end of a ser end of a sermon, they get the kids' eyes all closed. Who all wants to go to heaven? Well, you know, I'm going to raise my hand because the alternative is not very good. That doesn't mean you're saved. I mean, you don't get to do everything you want to do. I would like to go to the Florida Keys and get out of here during this pandemic. Of course, Florida is breaking out, aren't they? You know, but I want to go to Hawaii. I haven't been. There's a lot of things I want to do. That's what I'm getting. I don't get to do. You don't always get what you want, right? Of course people want to go to heaven. That's why we need to preach the true gospel to them. You know, when we try and tip them, heaven's going to be great. You're not going to get sick there. Grandma's not going to die. And I talk about those things. Those things are true. But, you know, we really miss it. If we go to Revelation and we see John's vision of heaven, 
the central figure in heaven is the Lamb of God. It's Jesus. And everybody, the people are like, I've, heard, I've had kids tell me, well, I get to play video games here. Well, I get to play video games in heaven. And you know, adults worry about just as trivial things. I don't, I, you know, I know this. Uh, we're going to be around that throne. And we're going to be worshiping Him. And we're going to be filled with joy. And we're going to be filled with love. And we're going to be worshiping. You know what? We're not going to be worshiping one another. We're going to be worshiping the, Lamb, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He is the central figure in heaven. Hey, I'm glad I get to go. I'm glad I won't have any more pain. I'm glad there won't be any more sickness, sorrow, or dying. Right? But even heaven, it's, it's a great benefit. It's not about me. It's about Him. We make the Gospel about men. We have presented Jesus so, so often. I say we. You know, we all have some guilt at times. We better be careful. Present Christ as the great problem solver. That seems to be the, uh, the thrust of 2020. It has been for a number of years. Now what do I mean by that? Is God capable of doing anything? Yeah, everything but lying, right? According to the Scripture. He's all power. He, uh, he's, all, he's the great physician. I believe that. I believe that God hears and answers prayer. I believe that faith can move mountains, right? I'm not a faith healer. I don't have those powers. I'm not an apostle. Uh, and so I'm totally dependent upon God because I lack all of that power within myself. But let me say, we present, God, Christ is often presented in this way. You have problems, Christ can fix them. And that's why He died, according to me. Are you in financial disarray? Christ died, and He'll make you rich. Your marriage in trouble? He'll put your marriage back. I can't make those promises to sinners. So when I take the Gospel to sinners, I can't promise He's going to cure your cancer. I can't promise He's going to fix your relationships or that you're going to do what's necessary uh, and repent of your sins to fix your relationships. I can't promise He's going to fix all the financial problems that you may have, you or I may have created through bad decisions and aren't willing to, to, make, to start to work hard and be smart, amen, and, 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 and wise and fix those things. But we often, Christ is presented in that way, the great problem solver. Well, let me say, He is a huge problem solver because at the cross, He solved the problem of sin. If we will repent of our sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and be saved, and we need that. Men are sinners, and the Gospel confronts us with that, with our guilt, with how undone we are, and the greatest benefit. This is not your home. This is not your rest. He didn't promise us heaven on earth. The old country song says, I beg your pardon, I didn't promise you a rose garden. People are wondering what's wrong with the Gospel because they have struggles in life. David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. What he did promise is if you're saved, you know this to be true, that he has never left you and he never will and he'll never forsake you. And one of these days he's coming in the clouds and he's going to call you up and all of those things will fall away and the former things will be forgotten. But that hasn't happened yet. And the gospel, is, I'd rather be an old time Christian than anything I know. And I'm not telling you life's going to be bad. I'm not telling you life here is going to be good. But I know life there only happens if you trust in Christ. And the, the, the central of the Gospel has been changed. Come on. Calling your message the Gospel does not make it to be the Gospel message. Now, the best way, as I say, to refute gospel, uh, false Gospels is to preach the true Gospel given to us by the Lord's Apostles. I mean, just to preach it. And I think we need to. To preach the Scriptures. Search the Scriptures. Preach the Word. But I do believe it is necessary. I'm just going to give you a few brief tidbits, right? You'll recognize these names. And I don't do this often. To expose and refute the soul. Because they're so common. There is a common thread to false preaching and teaching. Nearly universal errors and heresy that are being called gospel today. So I'll share a little bit of what's being preached, what's being said by so many in pulpits today for the purpose of contrasting that with truth. So what are men saying? What, what, what does the Scriptures teach? You'll recognize this name. Joel Osteen. I'm just going to give you a couple quotes, okay? He says this. He was in an interview on the Today Show. As to who goes to heaven, I can't be the judge of that. If you stop there, he's right, right? But here's what he, here's what he continues. There are good people. There are different religions. I just thank God I'm not the one who gets to choose or who gets to decide. John... I can tell you who goes to heaven. People who trust in nothing, absolutely nothing but Jesus Christ. Have genuine faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you're trusting in some other prophet by some name, you don't have to be Baptist to go to heaven. You don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. But you better have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, in His work, in His death, His resurrection. It's Jesus plus nothing, minus nothing. 
Jesus said in John 14, 6, considering Osteen's statement, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's a reason we have verses like that. So when somebody asks us if everybody's going to heaven, we can pretty much say, I don't want to be judgmental. I'm not being judgmental. But not everybody's going to heaven. You don't go just because you want to. You don't go because you practice some form of religion. But no man cometh unto the Father, Jesus said, but by me, without Christ, you have no hope. You're not going to build a bridge. You're not going to go across on some other way. But Jesus is not a way. He's the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. Alright, so one other from Osteen. We'll move on. Because I don't want to have this image in my head all day, right? He has said on numerous occasions that he believes that 99 point whatever, he changes that, the point, percent of all people are truly good. Now, you'll go into one church. He's not the only one that says that. You'll come in here and I will tell you you are a bunch of good-for-nothing sinners, okay? And you need Christ. You need to be saved. You're filthy. You're undone. Woe is me. I'm a man. I'm undone, Isaiah said. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But then you go to another church and say, I'm going to preach the gospel. And they're going to start with 99% of you are pretty, are really good people anyway. Now, there, there's that humanism. There's that. There's I got this. I got this from human. You know, it's a humanistic gospel. But if you believe that 99 percent of all people are truly good, virtuous, righteous, would lead me to ask, then why? Why then do we need a gospel? Yeah. If men are good, why do we need a gospel? If men are, you still watch the news and believe people are good. You still listen to. Them. I'm both. You listen to Republicans and Democrats, right and left, and you think people are good. You listen to preachers in America and you believe people are good. If men are good, who did Jesus die for? Yeah, that's right. They that are whole need not a physician. Why did he say that to the Pharisees? Because they were practicing what they wanted to practice. Believing what they wanted to believe. Believing in their religion. Believing in their, their works and their sincerity and their piousness and their obedience and their outward show. And he says, you know what? No, you don't need me. Now they did, but they, they, they that are holding me, not a physician. He told them, search the Scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. The Scriptures will always point you to Christ. Joyce Meyer. She said, I am not poor. These are quotes. I am not miserable, and I am not a sinner. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is what I were, and if I still was, then Jesus died in vain. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I, I didn't stop sinning until I finally got through my thick head I wasn't a sinner anymore. And the religious world thinks that's heresy. They want to hang you for it, but the Bible says that I am righteous, and I can't be righteous and be a sinner at the same time. She believes it, obviously, in the doctrine of holiness, that we literally are without sin. She says she no longer sins because she's saved. I hope this doesn't disappoint you, but I sin. I'm pretty pretty regularly. Pretty, yeah. Way too habitual. I and I know that sounds funny, right? I'm being sarcastic. I need call to repentance. And God does so through His Word regularly. I get pride lifted up in me. I get angry. I think evil thoughts. I'm lazy at times, slothful. I think too lonely of others. I gossip. Oh, man, I could go on. We don't want to preach all day. If I go on about my sin, we will be here tomorrow. Yeah. And I'm the preacher. Boy, if the preacher's that bad, what hope do I have? Your hope's not in me. That's what I'm preaching on this morning. Yeah. There's a sinner standing in the pulpit telling you about Jesus. There's a bunch of sinners in the pews. Don't, hey, you say, I'm gonna, man, somebody may already be worried and doubting because I'm preaching on the gospel. Don't go out and try and do better. Give up on that and trust in Christ. Amen. That's right. You say, well, I'm going to start praying more. I'm going to start reading my Bible. That's all good. But if you're not saved, that won't get you into heaven. I hope you do read your Bible because the Scriptures will tell you to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Christ Jesus. All right, so I'm on one more. There's Kenneth Copeland. Yeah. <laughs> He's been around a while, hasn't he? Yes, he has. No. He preaches what most would say. Now you hear people say, oh, they preach a prosperity gospel. I think most people, uh, other preachers looking at this, I, I don't do this a lot. I mean, man, even famous or even on TV, but I think we would all agree he preaches a prosperity gospel. I mean, he, he, he himself calls it that, prosperity. He, he believes that if you're not prospering, you don't have faith. Okay? 
uh, and his wife, Gloria Copeland, they're co-ministers. The Copelands are leaders in what is commonly referred to as the Word of Faith movement, or the Prosperity Gospel. You can read a lot of what he says about faith. It's way out there. I'm not going to read that. But a Prosperity Gospel. A Prosperity Gospel which falsely teaches that God will, uh, God's will for believers is always prosperity. They teach that. And that's very popular today. That God's perfect will for you is absolute health, wealth, joy, comfort, prosperity. And uh, if there's if that's not happening, that is an issue of faith because that is they know that that is absolutely God's will for His children. They believe victory in every situation, no matter what. So when hard times hit, and they do, right? I can't imagine getting away with preaching a prosperity gospel to people that are suffering. I mean, could you imagine if what Kenneth Copeland preaches, and I'm going to give you a quote here and say, if Paul had tried to preach it in the first century, I mean, in some of the impoverished world and persecuted and suffering and diseased uh, world where he was ministering, if he went and told them, you know, you trust in Christ, this all goes away instantly. If that's what the purpose of the Gospel was, it, had no, it wasn't about our sin. And then he, so he preaches that, and, none, and that doesn't change. I mean, if you know anything about the history of the church, you know anything about the Dark Ages, you know anything about those first few centuries, well, how, what believers were going through, or even as I said earlier, talking about missionaries, what some are going through in foreign fields to, to try and preach. You know why you can get away with the prosperity gospel in America and preach it? And people are like, hey, it seems true. Because people are living it. We live... We are blessed people. I mean, we live in America and we, we, we have a higher standard of living than most places in the world. And so when you preach a prosperity gospel and this couple has went through you know, college and they've got big jobs and they've got all kinds of student loans but they own a half a million dollar house in the suburbs and it's got a pool in the backyard and they're sitting there, you know, with electronic control making the air conditioner go up and down and everything. They, they're like, this must be true. What this preacher's saying must be true, of course. When the bill collectors start coming about 10, 15 down, years down the road and the economy takes a dip and the retirement fund is plunging and everything, they're like wondering, what's going on? And then the preacher tells them, oh, your faith has really suffered. Yeah. Well, yeah, it has, I guess. Because it was in my bank account, not in Christ. So here's what kept some things from Kenneth Copeland. Uh, here we go. Copeland said, uh, could, it, could it be that God has some sovereign reason for suffering or that He uses it to teach us or to help us grow. Copeland says no. In word, faith, theology, failure, sickness, and hardship are always attacks from Satan and are never God's will. I believe Copeland is wrong. The Bible clearly tells us that sometimes it is actually God's will that we suffer. I believe that God has purpose in all things. He never slumbers, neither does He sleep. We may not understand the God's will, but most of the time we don't. And we don't see it coming, right? But the eyes of the Lord in every place. His arms are everywhere. We see, I mean, how in the world do you teach that and you see stories like Job's story? Or King David. Or the Apostle Paul himself being beaten, thrown in prison, threatened with death. And then you're going to take his words and say that if you just 